Run, river, run, run through the hills. Run, river, run to the sea. Run, river, run to your place beneath the sun. Run, river, run. Hi, welcome to be my guest. This is Jan Lewis, your host. Today we have back Sh- Sally Chetwind, and Sally is an author. She's also the CEO of Brass Castle Arts. Where did you come up with that name? Uh, that comes out of my engineering, uh, yeah. the, the Civil War stuff, and the Brass Castle is the insignia on the hats of the engineers. I didn't know that. Sally is amazing. Not only does she work full-time in, in engineering, right? Yeah. Okay. She also is a writer, and she is a world a Civil War reenactment person. How many of those reenactments do you go to per year? Um, a lot fewer in the last several years, primarily because of financial issues. Yeah. But I'm hoping to turn that around a little bit. And uh, but yeah, back in the day, uh, my husband and I, <laughs> we we had one season where we started in April, and. We were gone every single weekend, one thing or another, yeah. until I think it was the middle or the end of July when a, a fellow wanted us to come to his event in Connecticut, and we said, we can't. We have to get new tires for the van, because <laughs> we haven't been home long enough to get new tires. Yeah. Did you get the tires? We got the tires. All right, and then now, we were back on the road like Sally was with us. I think I looked at it. You were with us in uh, 2016. Was it 16? I couldn't remember. About three years ago. And she, I don't know if you remember, but she had written Bead of Sand. That was your first visit with us. That was. And I believe, not too long ago, Sally got back in touch with me. And she, had, wait till you see the cover has written the sturgeon's dance. And a sturgeon, what kind of fishy is a sturgeon? It's very archaic. It's uh, real definitely related to dinosaurs and such. They're bony and they're very strange because they don't really have a mouth. They have like a tube that they can bring up and, and then drop down to the bottom. How did you and, hear about a sturgeon? Well, I know that sturgeons dance. Nobody knows why, but if they're out in the water, you're out, say you're out on a boat. Yeah. And you happen to be at a place where sturgeons dance, right. and they just leap out of the water, and they can go on and on and on. You've seen them. I've actually heard them. I've never seen them. They they talk. <laughs> no. When I was living years ago, I was right out of college, and I was uh, living on the banks of the uh, Kennebec River in Augusta, in Augusta, Maine. I was born in Maine, Portland. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so I was that close to the river that at night, I could hear them splashing, leaping and splashing. Wow. In and the, you grew up and you got like to hear that. 300 pound fish. They're huge. They can get very big. What's it like? Is it pretty good luck getting one? Catching one? Um, I don't know. I know there are people that, that do fish for them, and there's different species in different mm. parts of the country. Can you eat and them? The world. I mean, yeah, you can eat them. Can yeah. eat I mean, them. this is where we get caviar. From sturgeons? From sturgeons. Uh, yeah. Caviar is green, isn't it, with little circles? Well, some in of it? it's green, and some of it's red, and some of it's black, and some of it's white. Doesn't Depends it have the, like little eyes in it? Sally, like little eyes. I don't know. I've only ever seen the gray, the black. I don't know. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> All right. All right. Now the sturgeon stance. I don't want to give this away. So you go. Give us a general idea what it's about. Well, in this book, um, two characters, Josie and uh, Rory, they are psychically connected from birth, but they never meet until they're th- about thirty. Yeah. And they're in their early thirties. And so when they finally do meet, when he comes into her office as a consultant, they're trying to figure out, for the rest of the book, they're trying to figure out what's going on between us yeah. anyway. Yeah. And, of course, you've got to have the baggage and stuff that each one has to deal with. So uh, uh, Now, Josie had second sight, if it could be called that. It wasn't clairvoyance. The word translated literally as clear sight. For there was nothing clear in what she saw. Now, she had some childhood dreams. What were those all about? Yeah, she'd have these, well, like most children, you you know, you have these strange dreams Mm. and uh, sometimes nightmares, generally, you know, generated by whatever TV show you might have watched. But um, she had uh, unusual dreams, primarily in her later, like in in, in, uh, adolescence and teenage years. And then she has these four very powerful dreams uh, in, her, in her college years. And then by the time she's 30 and she meets Rory, I think she gets to the point where she really is ready to wonder more about them. Yeah. 
So he, it, he stimulates that remembrance. With each new dream, she would bolt up in bed, racked with torment. They it, were bad. They were bad dreams. Where did you get the idea for this? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this, the, I mean, just it's it's got an um, an aura of mystery. Would you say fantasy or just mystery? More paranormal. Real? Okay, paranormal. Yeah, yeah. Paranormal. An, agnetic, an, an en enigmatic friend, Shadow, kept company so close that Rory was nine before he figured out that Shadow was a separate being and that not everyone had one. So that was his first clue that he was a little on the paranormal side. Yeah. But where he grew up with it, he didn't think of it as abnormal necessarily. Shadow was like a little creature type of thing, wasn't it? Or just kind, kind of, of a spirit. A spirit really? creature. Yeah. Now she did not jo she didn't grow up with a shadow type no. of thing. No. So by the time they met, that was like they were combining the two. And for viewers, how did they what did they do once they they, they blended their two talents? Well it's not so much a blend as a entwining. Yeah. Because if they blended, they'd become more and more like each other. Yeah. And that doesn't happen. But it's like the paths are converging, and then they're running this parallel path. And uh, yeah. it, was, it was tricky to figure out where it was going and how it was going to go. How long did it take you to write this? Well, it's kind of funny, because we, we talked three years ago about Bead of Sand. Yeah. And that took 20 years. Not yes. that I was writing it constantly, no. by any stretch. This one I started 10 years earlier. This came before the other this one? This was started before the other. This one I started in 1983. And by the time I got to where I got interested in Bead of Sand, yeah. this one I had not worked on much. I, I didn't know where it was going. I didn't, the premise was fuzzy. I had no idea what the ending was going to be. Yeah. And I just got kind of frustrated. Yeah. And after I wrote Bead of Sand, I turned back to this because the characters from Sturgeon's Dance came to me in a dream about four months after Beat of Sand was done, and they said to me, don't forget about us. So I thought, I guess I better not. Do you enjoy paranormal shows on TV? I don't really, wa I don't watch much TV at all. Yeah, you don't have any time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> My God. So this took you, this was, that took 10 years, right? Well, that took 20. 20. Yeah. And this was even thought in your mind before then. Yeah. Wonder why that came before Sturgeon's Dance. I think because I wasn't mature enough to write that. I didn't have the emotional experience yeah. and maturity to deal with that. So this comes along, and this is a much more comfortable book. Yeah. And it's... Well, it's, I like the mystery, the kind of that feeling, the woo yeah, feeling in this yeah. one. Sally Chetwin's interests include American history, writing, graphics, folk music, engineering, and maritime topics. She holds a B.A. in Human Ecology from College of the Atlantic. Where is that? Bar Harbor, Maine. Okay, and has worked in land planning, pipe fitting, and drafting. You're an engineer. Well, a I'm not civil a war... I'm not an engineer. You're a what? I'm not, a, I'm not an engineer. I don't have a degree in that. Okay. But a I've Civil War reenactor. She met her husband on the battlefield. A native of Maine, she currently lives in Massachusetts. You live way up there. Way, well, to me, Andover is like, <laughs> wait, whatever is like up in, uh, you know, Nova Scotia or something. Not quite, not quite. <laughs> you, now, this, she had sent me this wonderful note, and it said, The Sturgeon's Dance has led me to tackle my next writing project, a nonfiction work. This will be new for you, right? Well, give us a hint. What is it all about? It's about um, the murder and the of a uh, of a police officer, Maine State Police officer, in my hometown of South Berwick, Maine, which is a very small place, in 1964, and this book will be about that, how that happened, the aftermath, the immediate aftermath, and the subsequent long-term repercussions on his family and his community, and it's powerful stuff. Very powerful stuff. And you're in the process with it right now. I'm in the process. I'm starting research. Um, I've made friends with his youngest son and his widow, and so we're collaborating on this. Um, they've known that this story needed to be out, mm -hmm. but they hadn't ever articulated it. When I was finishing so the Sturgeon's Dance, that came out in September. Mm -hmm. In July, I'm fooling around with polishing and doing the last edits before it finally goes to print. 
and uh, one day all of a sudden just poof, right into my head yeah this lightning bolt of a statement says you need uh, a dedication for this book yeah why would I need a dedication for a novel and before I could hardly think that to myself the answer came it needs to be dedicated to trooper Charles C black yeah who was the man who had been killed yeah. when I was 10 yeah and uh, so I was like wow so I went home, I told my husband about it, and his immediate reaction is, well, you've got to get in touch with the family, if you can find them. Yeah, get there okay to do it. Yeah. yeah. And so I wrote a letter. I found, I found an address um, for the youngest son, because he was named after his father, so it made it quite easy to find him. Yeah. And he's in the same town, yeah. which is the next town over from, uh, from South Borough. I bet they were happy and grateful to you. And so I, I wrote this letter. It was a two-page explaining who I was, what my project was, yeah. and why I had decided to dedicate it. And I included the dedication. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm sticking this letter into an envelope, and I look at the, the date yeah. that I had written the letter. It's the anniversary of the man's death. Oh my God! And I thought, oh. what year was it? This what year was this? It? Was this just last year? Just last year. Yeah. And so they got it, and then what was their response? Two days later, I had an email from the son, and they were from, from and he's family. going, "Whoa, blown away!" Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you've got it. Is almost you're almost like a ghostwriter for them, but In it's a your sense. book. But it's your book. Yeah. But it's their story. Do you, have, do you have to go back and forth and listen more to them and their part of it? Yeah, 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 there'll be a lot of that, and, uh, and I'm thinking for about six months after we met yeah. and decided this is something, yeah, we do want to do, Sure. Uh, for about six months I, I waffled about it, so what's relevant about it today? Yeah. I mean, this was before we had uh, racial issues, this was before we had the police or pigs, the Vietnam War uh, period riots, mm -hmm. this was before we had the illegal immigration, this is before we had the war on police. So what's, how, does it, how is it relevant today? Yeah. And I finally figured it out. I knew if I put it on my back burner long enough I'd, I'd find you that connection. The connection is the support services for families of, of fallen officers mm -hmm. They were non-existent in 1964. There wasn't, it wasn't even a pension plan for this family. And today, there are services. So what I want to do is to compare the, the old days, 50 years ago, with what's happening today, and identify the, the inadequacies, because there are still a lot. Yeah. There's a lot of yeah. stigma about um, such things. And, and families, you know, after the first several months of support, mm -hmm. a lot of times they get kind of forgotten. It's not news anymore. Everybody has to go about back to their business. So I want to see that. And fortunately and unfortunately, um, uh, a month ago, there was a Maine State Police trooper killed That's right. on the highway mm -hmm. in Bangor, yep. quite by accident. Uh, it was a freak accident. But he's gone. He mm -hmm. leaves a young wife and a little boy, six months old. And when is this book coming out, Sally? I'm hoping in three or four years. I'm hoping it can be that soon. That soon? That's a long time. Well, it's going to take a long time to do this research. Wow. That yeah. is... Sally, how could people reach you if they'd like to get a copy of The Sturgeon's Dance? Um, well, I, unfortunately, I don't have a website yet. I'm working on it, but you know how these things go. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, people can get in touch with me directly through my email address, which is okay. brasscastlearts at gmail.com. And it is available on um, Amazon as a hardcover mm -hmm. or as uh, an ebook. Now, with your schedule, it's probably tough for you to get out there giving presentations and book signings. Where have you appeared, though? Not many places Not yet. Not many. <laughs> There's a, you know, it's funny. Uh, some authors, oh, I'll go all over New England. Easy. That's great. I mean, I can yeah. tell, take you. If you were to travel, would you be willing to go just anywhere you could, just to get into the, the like, say, the fairs? Things? Uh -huh. Yeah. See, that's, that's, that attitude is fantastic. You never know who you're going to meet. That's you right. You never know. Absolutely. So now you've got two books. Two books. If you were going to promote one right now, would it be The Sturgeon's Dance? At this point, yeah. It'd be Sturgeon's Dance. I can't wait for the next one because that, that police officer story is written. Now, will you explain to us what Brass Castle Arts is? Is it, are you a publisher for your own, for people's books? What nope. is it? It's, uh, it's what I do when I'm not working a regular 9 to 5 job. Is it the enactment? Well, it includes that. Um, 
ultimately, I'm I'm working toward retirement. So yeah, I've been no, I've been I've been really? building I've been building up things that will prepare me for making money during retirement. Yeah. Because eventually I'm going to get to a point where I either can't commute anymore or I'm sick and tired of commuting. <laughs> and uh, yeah. so I want to work from home or yeah. whatever. So I've, uh, I've been building my ability to do copy editing yeah. and proofreading and that sort of stuff. Yeah. And um, I've signed up for a course. I haven't taken any of the online classes yet, but I have paid for them for uh, copywriting. Ah, and that's nice. another open window there. Is that something where you could also help an author get, they, if they've got their manuscript ready, what's that IE, what's that number you have to get? IE number, I, not an IEP, it's oh. a, the official, oh. It's yeah, the one that the Library of Congress uses. Yeah. Yeah. Can you, no, you wouldn't do no, that. No, I'm not, not interested in that sort that. of thing. So you would be I'm interested in the meat of, of, a, of a book or yeah, a story. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Now, you've already started it. Yeah. Now, how could people get in touch with you if they'd like to get involved in that? If they'd like to have Brass, your help? BrassCastleArts at gmail.com. Yeah. I just got done uh, beta reading a friend of mine's book, a memoir, okay, of yeah. growing up in Iowa, com contrasted with now living in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. married to a man who's from England, mm -hmm. and adopted two Korean boys as children. What so, a story. The, yeah, I know. It's the, the, her little, little essays, little personal so essays. So you're editing are fast. You're editing it for yeah. Yeah, one of the beta readers. She's got, show us your surgeon stance, a wonderful posters. Let's show this one first. Okay, this is the book we're talking about right now. It, there's a copy downstairs in the <coughs> upper library, The Sturgeon's Dance, and it borders on the metaphysical, the paranormal, yep. kind of mysterious. And this fellow, Rory, came to work as a consultant with Jody. Right, Jory. And this, Joy, Josie. And, Josie. And this is how they, the story of like what, what happened when they were kind of working together, but yeah. they kept apart, but kind of together. Yeah. And it, this was many years ago you had this idea. Yeah. Some uh, of it stems from when I was working at Bath Iron Works. And there is a scene toward the back, the end of the book, which yeah. you've read, yeah. um, where Shadow shows up yeah. and he, it, yeah. illuminates Josie in front of Rory when he's sitting at home minding his own business one afternoon. Yeah. And that happened to a friend of mine. Oh, like a vision. The yeah, like a vision or an aura. That's paranormal. Yeah, and so this friend of mine, who was a fellow worker at the Ironworks, he uh, he's minding his own business, sitting in his living room one Sunday afternoon, and this aura just showed up in the middle of his living room, and it had me in it. So he came in on Monday morning, and he's we we caught up with each other. And he says, "Weirdest thing happened to me." Yeah, and so I. Was why we were wondering about that. We couldn't figure out what it was all about, but um, that helped form the, the helped whole form shadow idea. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's pretty cool because you know we've had uh, we've had paranormal experts, investigators on the show, um, and everybody has a different take on it. What has happened to them in their life? Yeah. Uh, I, I get a kick out of some of the shows on TV, uh, like Ghost Adventures. A little on the dramatic side, uh, <laughs> fifty fifty on that. There was an excellent one called um, Paranormal Lockdown. These were only two. They took it very seriously, and they would be locked down for 72 hours. It could be an old insane asylum. It could be an old jail, a school. And they would camp there, and they'd have all the equipment. Yeah. And that I kind of found a little more believable. You know, but you, you don't, that, but that's kind of I've a... I've never seen that one, but... Oh, it's true. Now, she also brought in uh -huh, a CD <laughs> called... Shades of Grey, songs that will linger. She's also in a band, a, like a singing band, right? Yeah, it's a it's a string band. Where, where do you originate from? Where does it? Where do you? Where do you all sing? Um, actually, the group is out of Framingham. So you go to Framingham to sing? Yeah. Well, well, we go wherever people hire the group to go. We practice in Framingham. How did you all meet? At a Civil War reenactment. And whose idea was it to start the band? Uh, that was part of the Twelfth Georgia. Infantry reenactment group. Yeah. Oh, probably 15 years ago, mm -hmm. the 12th Georgia Infantry no longer exists, but the music part of it does has, has still. Right, this yeah. is all music that would have been during the Civil War. Yep. Where all do they find music. those songs? That's amazing. Oh, Stephen Foster wrote hundreds of them, and there were all kinds of other people that wrote songs from the period. Well, I think more music came out of the Civil War than any other time in American history. Hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of songs. I didn't songs. know that. You know, and then we have, like we've talked before, my great-great-grandfather was the 
inventor of the Jocelyn rifle, which the government bought during the Civil War. But it's funny, my family really didn't, I didn't learn this till I was grown up or years later. I don't know why it was such a, it was not a secret, but it wasn't talked about. Yeah. I think it, it never occurred to anybody to talk about it. No, I don't think so. Um, they it, didn't it think was, it was important. I guess not, and I guess he worked with, you know in Milbury's next door here, yeah. I think he was, uh, he worked with Asa Waters, the famous Asa Waters mansion, who was also into military uh, supplying. So I'm trying to get down to brass tacks here and find more information. I know you looked it up too, but uh, it has me fascinated. I am the opposite of interested in guns, okay? <laughs> That's not it. But I'm interested in my great In the great history great. of it. Exactly, yeah. and I'm yeah. named after, that's my middle name is their, their last name. Wait, who made the CD? Um, Shades of Grey. We, we recorded it a year ago, February, yeah. in this teensy weensy studio in Jaffrey, New Hampshire. Loud, uh, Loud Sun Studio. Is that near Plymouth? Uh, not far from Plymouth. It's closer to Keene, I think. Okay. And it's up in the middle of no place. And uh, so this fellow named Ben Rogers, he just built it out in his backyard. So we stuffed the 10 of us into this little teeny room. And Ben sets up all of these microphones and baffles. And so we, we each had a microphone. Some of us had two, depending on if we were singing and then playing something. Sure. And, uh, or depending if he's singing and guitar, whatever. Mm -hmm. sure. And uh, we, we had spent the previous four weekends, or Saturdays, going over this music with a fine-tooth comb practicing and getting what we wanted. So when we went into the studio, which we had to pay time for, yeah. we were able to get these uh, ultimately 16 songs um, in almost all of them one take each. All from the Civil War era. Yeah. Now I see only you and uh, Carol Garvey are the two late, only ladies in the group. Now there's how many of you in all? Uh, right now we've got uh, 12 or 13. I was thinking how, I mean, I'd love to have you all on the show. I'm just thinking, how would we get you on the show? <laughs> I don't know. You have to send us send us a uh, <clears throat> JPEG or something of your music. Yeah. And then have maybe three of you come on and talk about it. I, that'd be, because I had never... That's a possibility. I never yeah. heard of this, uh, Sally. I had never heard of this. The group is growing. Oh, yeah, okay. How Actually, we get we're needing this? a fiddler. Because you need a fiddler? The, yeah, the fellow who fiddles, Greg, uh, Greg Con uh, Conti, gotcha. brasscastlearts at gmail dot com. Now, don't forget. Okay, that's one of the <laughs> things she does. She works all day. She's an author. <laughs> <laughs> this Sturgeon's dance, though, you know, you got to, you know, more people see these at the expos and at the libraries, senior centers. Yeah. You, you know, what? I have a lot of authors say to me, well, why would they care about my book at uh, senior center or? At a cafes, senior say you would be surprised. Yeah, because these I, people like to read. Exactly, yeah. and I had one author say, "Can you can you do research on all the best cafes in the New England area?" Which I did, and he's been trying them. Also, other uh, television stations, many of the other uh, places. That's another great thing to do. Yep, it's a lot of fun. But you got you got to get get it out there, my friend. Go downstairs too at the library. Pick up a copy. Read it. Um, now, Sally, are you telling me I've got to wait another three years for this one? You're, you're it takes time to write these things. Well, I suppose with all of you, yeah, and you need time, more time to sleep, <laughs> right? <laughs> you, I don't know. I don't really know how you do it because if you cram it, you're working. Are you working nine to five? Um, I usually get in about seven thirty, oh. and I leave five ish, six ish. You must be exhausted. Well, you know, if you keep moving, you don't notice. <laughs> You said keep eating. So you come home, you have dinner. When do you no, write? I don't. I don't have dinner. Why? I have breakfast, and it's usually substantial. And then I have a late lunch. Yeah. And then by the time I get home, I, you know, I don't. Even, I don't get hungry until like nine or ten. And if I'm that hungry, I'll have a little cereal and milk before I go to bed. I don't want much at night anyway. When do you write? At, you know, in the late hours of the night. Um, a lot of times it'll be at home after work. Yeah. After I've cooked some things for my husband and me to eat. Oh, my God. To the next day. What does your husband think of your books? He doesn't talk about them at all. I mean, it's hard to get him to read them because he's not much of a reader anyway. Really? And when yeah. he does read, it's primarily stuff about Abraham Lincoln okay. or the Civil War because that's well, oh, his yeah. shtick. Yeah. That, does he work, too, like you do? Um, he's retired now um, on disability. Yeah. Yeah, after 40-odd years of uh, cleaning offices and such things. <laughs> both his back and his feet gave out. How about grandchildren, children? No, we don't have any children. Yep. Any animals, pets? We had a dog, 
but he got old and he died. We had to have him put down. Yeah. We miss him a lot. Definitely. He was a demented demon dog. A demented demon dog? Because people? if you weren't part of his pack, he was going to eat you. What kind was he? He was a cockapoo, about, about so big. I thought a cockapoo was a uh, parrot or some kind of Well, that's a cockatiel. Oh. <laughs> Okay, Cockapoo I got it. Cockapoo is a oh. poodle, cock, or spaniel mix. I know, I've heard more mixes like uh, poodle do or... Oh, yeah, they've got the labradoodles and... Labradoodle. Yeah. La- all that thing. As long as it's not hyper, I love it. My yeah. favorite is a basset. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, we and, had a half basset when I was a kid. Oh, he was something else. <laughs> oh, they're funny. It's like, I'll be your friend. <laughs> I'll lay down. And they lie down, they roll over, and they leave half of their skin on the other side of them. <laughs> Have you ever watched a, a human try to walk a basset? It's the funniest thing. It's like the basset. Oh, stop, sniff around. And it's almost like the basset's leading the human yeah, yeah. on their own. There's a commercial on TV, a guy for one of the one of the medications, and he's like... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's, 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 he's trying to get the basset, basset to go with him. Come on, busy. Thanks for being with us, Sally. It's been a pleasure. All right, now, it's always I wanna, great fun. I want to see you much sooner than two or three years. Come yeah. on. Come on now. I've got to write a book proposal first because I'm hoping to get this into a traditional p- well, publisher. You s- yeah, but you self-publish and you do a great job. Well... The, the non-fictions usually do better if if they're if you propose that really? to a traditional oh, publisher. Okay. But you got to do your homework and you know write some chapters and you got to yeah. assess the market. Only problem though with that is when you when it gets out of your hands and a publisher has it, you have no say over the covers. And then they once they get it out, that's all they do. They don't get you promote. They don't get you pu- uh, publicized. That's it. Well, you know you have to do all your own marketing, but that's no worse than what I'm doing now. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's why. <laughs> but I do have I, I do have a number of people that I've gotten in touch with yeah. in, about this project yeah. who are much more professional at it than I am, and I've got a lot of them in my court now because they see that this story, there's other books similar that have been written, but they don't focus specifically on surviving families. Yeah, that's that's oh god, it's so timely. Thank you yeah. for being with us, Sally. Thank you. And I know we're going to see you next time. <laughs> on a shooting star Heading out toward a dream